Welcome to this sacred hour in which we are united to one another by the grief that is a part of the love that we have shared. May God be with you, the God of love and grace, who is known to each one of us according to our ways of knowing God. May God be with you, God whose peace passes all understanding and so is wide and deep enough to hold all of us. May God be with you, God who shares our sadness, shares our grief, shares our tears. May God be with you, God who binds up the broken and finds the lost, God whose life is stronger than even death itself, God who raises us in new life, in power and in love. May God be with you. Today we find comfort in each other's presence. We speak and hear the words that are needed for this time. We celebrate memories and we join in prayer. We are gathered this afternoon to commend to God with thanksgiving and love the life of Hans B. Hunziger. Here in the protective cover of healing love, we offer thanks for Hans's life. We share our lament for his illness and for his death. And in the strength of a community of faith, we receive anew the assurance of that which eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor human imagination envisioned, the new life of God's resurrection. Plymouth Church is a Christian church where we affirm that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. From different faith traditions and practices, you are welcome. If religious practice or belief is not a part of your life, you are welcome. This is a church for skeptics and for faithful, for doubters and wanderers and believers. Here we center our lives on loving practice. In that spirit, I invite you to receive and to join in the hymns and prayers of this service in the way that is most appropriate to you. These are the practices of our faith community that help us to connect to the sacred presence we know as God and whose love and hope we have found to be crystallized in the life of Jesus of Nazareth and in his resurrection. Your presence and the love that you bring is a witness to God's grace upon Hans and upon his family and his community of loved ones. We welcome all of you who are joining us from other places as well. If you are joining us live from somewhere else, and if you are, would you please take a moment to type a comment as you are joining us to let us know who you are and where you're joining us from. That will be a gift and meaningful to us and especially to Hans's family. We are grateful to be joined today by a former organ scholar of this church, Sol Rosado, and by a former minister of this church, Shantia Monroe. Following the service, all are welcome to a reception, a time to extend your care toward Lisa and Henry and all of Hans's family and to one another. At the conclusion of the service, I will escort the family downstairs first, and then you are welcome to follow. The fellowship hall is located just below this sanctuary, and you can reach it by the stairs through this door on my left or through this door on my right uh, to the stairs or to the elevator down one level. And now I invite you to please join me in a spirit of prayer and to join me in saying the words of the prayer of invocation as printed. O oh God of grace and glory, we remember before you today our brother Hans. We thank you for giving him to us to know and to love as a companion in our pilgrimage on earth. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn, give us your aid, so that we may see in death the gate to eternal life, that we may continue our course on earth in confidence until by your call we are reunited with those who have gone before us. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
Amen. I now invite you to rise in body or in spirit to sing our first hymn found in the black hymnal number 473, Blessed Assurance. verses 12 to 17. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything. <laughs> which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen.
Good morning. Uh, my name is Paul Harris. Um, I've been a friend of Hans um, for, I figured it out last night, I think roughly 50 years, 50, 51 years. I'd, I'd first like to uh, extend my deepest sympathy to all the Hunziker family, all the relatives and all the friends who are here today and people who couldn't make it as well. Um, Hans was absolutely one of the most genuine, good people um, I have ever known. The times we spent together uh, were very joyful and uh, I'm, gra I'm grateful to have those memories. Um, our story began with uh, three neighborhood friends, Hans, Mario, and Paul. Um, still not sure exactly how that started, but uh, Paul knew Mario, Mario knew Hans. We joined forces and became the three amigos. Um, people actually called us that. They called us other, probably three stooges as well. Um, we spent so much time together, people, um, oh, I already covered that. Um, when we were 11 or 12 um, years old, you know, we did typical kid stuff, hung out at each other's houses, played games, hide and seek with the other neighborhood kids. I mean, we used the entire neighborhood. Um, went to Roots Corner Store, Hershey's Deli. Hans's favorite sub was the Hawaiian. Um, we spent a lot of time at the Hunziker house. Um, Bob and Joan, Jim, Billy, Eric were great and, and very welcoming. Um, they really made us feel welcome and part of that family. Um, so much so, they started taking us on vacation with them to their place on Buston's Island, which was really an incredible experience. Bus Buston's is in Casco Bay. It's a three mile boat ride from the Harrisicate Marina in South Freeport, Maine. And uh, it, it really, when you get into Casco Bay, it looks like something out of National Geographic. It's wide open ocean dotted with islands. Um, very beautiful, a lot of wildlife, seals, ospreys, blue herons. The Hunzigers really gave us a lot of autonomy. Um, you know, by the time we were 13, 14 years old, we had access to the motorboat, the skiff, and the sailboat, and spent our days, you know, exploring all day long, uh, mostly up there with Joan. She would be playing tennis and doing stuff with her friends. Um, we kept that cadence up for years, through junior high, high school. Actually, Hans went away to Gould Academy, but when he came back, you know, we picked up where we left off. Um, yeah, and we were back together, and most of the summers were up in Maine with the Hunzigers. Our other friends uh, were invited up to uh, the, Hun the Hunzigers were so very generous that way. Um, I actually um, looked over some pictures, and we had a really large group up there um, in 1988. Um, it's, uh, Hans, Mario, myself, we met Lisa. That's the first time I think I met you. Um, so it was a lot of fun. So what was Hans like? Easygoing, friendly, generous, fun-loving, loyal friend. He had that, uh, that big out loud laugh I'm sure everyone who knows him is familiar with. Carried that with him his whole life. Um, he was also good with his hands and um, really, really good with the boats. The motorboat, sailboat, didn't matter. Um, those skills served him later in life, you know, when he was building sets. And I think he actually built a boat. He was the whole reason we could do all that exploring. You know, Mario and I, you know, wouldn't have been able to do that on our own. And um, Mr. Hunziger and Mrs. Hunziger really trusted Hans. So, you know, 13, 14 years old, bombing around in the ocean, exploring islands. Um, he liked music a lot. We would hang out in his room, or Billy's when Billy wasn't there. Billy had like an apartment in that house, an incredible room. Um, you know, we'd play backgammon or plotted our next adventure. Hans really loved the Grateful Dead. We listened to all the early 1970s albums, studio albums, and the live ones, Skull and Roses, Europe 72. Um, Hans loved Jerry Garcia. 
In fact, there was a period um, when he was around 16 that he looked like Jerry Garcia, full <laughs> black hair, full black hair. He could grow a beard, I think, when he was 14. Hans. <laughs> we looked like we were 12, but Hansi was, was a grown man. Um, yeah, that part. Um, you know, time moved on. Um, Hans met the love of his life, Lisa, and they got married. Um, we actually went up to Maine for that. That was a really nice celebration. Um, and he eventually moved to Cleveland and started a family uh, with uh, Mr. Henry there. Um, Mario, Mario was married and raising a family in Westfield. And in 1997, I got married and moved to Colorado and started a family myself. So we all got a little busy with life. Um, really, more often than not, we communicated by you know, phone on occasion. Christmas cards, um, and then 2014 came along, and um, I got a call from Mario uh, letting me know about Hans's cancer, and that, uh, that definitely, you know, stops you in your tracks. I called Hans right away, and uh, he was absolutely incredible. He was just brave, positive, telling me about all the stuff he was doing to take care of himself. Um, he, he didn't feel sorry for himself one bit, and um, that was amazing. He wanted to know how I was doing, how my wife and kids were. You know, he's always thinking about other people. And then after that, we spoke every couple of months or so. Um, eventually, in 2017, we managed to get together up in Maine with Henry and my children, Charlie and Catherine, and that week was, was absolutely the best. Hans and I would get up every morning um, before the kids got up at around 7. And uh, if you haven't been there, there's a little, like, rustic golf course right outside their door. It's a nine-hole course. We played nine holes every single day. Um, you know, we got out in the boats with the kids. We fished off the dock. We actually caught a couple of striped bass, had a blast. Hans looked really good. Actually, Hans looked as healthy as I've, I've seen him. He was thin. He was going for lots of walks. Um, he really looked good. And then um, that following May, Hans actually came out to visit me in Colorado, and we went up to the North Platte River in Wyoming and went fishing, went fly fishing. Um, it's kind of funny. Uh, so when you go on a guide boat, there's an oarsman in the middle, and Hans, and you stand up, and brace your leg and fish standing while, they're, while you're floating down. And Hans was catching all the fish in the morning, and I wasn't catching anything. And I'm supposed to be the fisherman. And then I just hear this chuckle. And I look over, and it's Hans, he laughing at me. Um, I got a kick out of that. Um, that summer, Hans, Mario, and I got together on Bustin's. It was late August or early September. We, we had an absolute blast catching up. Hans cooked for us. He's a really good cook. You know that. Um, and then we closed up the house for the season. Um, Hans texted Mario and I this past June 15th. He let us know <clears throat> his treatment was over. And he was going to do hospice. And he ended it with, I uh, love you both. He asked, he asked us to give, us, give him a day or two before we called. Um, I spoke with him a few days after that. He sounded tired, but he was actually really positive, Hans, being Hans. He was really positive about um, visiting with his brothers, Jimmy and Eric, and how they took care of him. That meant the world to him. Uh, Lisa called and let us know, um, you know when Hansi passed and that he was surrounded by friends, so that was very consoling. I, I think that was fantastic. You know, I'm not going to say goodbye um, because I want to, you know, have Hans with me forever in my memories, but uh, Hans, I, I do want to thank you for all the memories we have together, and I want to thank you for being my, my incredible friend. I love you too.
I want to share my gratitude and support, uh, for your support today and appreciate you taking time, taking the opportunity to join us in celebrating Hans's life. My name is Eric Hunsker and I had the privilege of being Hans's little brother for almost 60 years. Sometimes you just get lucky in life, being surrounded by good people. Hans was one of those individuals that just made each day a little bit better. He was the third of four boys, had all the characteristics of a middle brother, easygoing, agreeable, even temperament, a negotiator or peacekeeper. His personality as a kid remained constant throughout his whole life. Big smile, hearty laugh, and willingness to help others. He knew his strengths and weaknesses and followed his instincts in his own authentic style and remained true to himself throughout his life. Family was important to Hans, and, investment, and his investment in us was significant. He was extremely close to our parents. As a young kid, Hans always uh, experienced heavy bouts of homesickness. Whether spending the night at our grandfather's house or going away to camp, there was always a phone call in the middle of the night asking my mom to pick him up immediately. <laughs> he outgrew the homesickness, but his family bonds only strengthened. Whether, mom was, uh, whether helping mom in the kitchen or working with dad on a new project, he was a resource they constantly re relied on. Uh, in later years, he took responsibility for cook cooking fantastic meals since he enjoyed bringing the family together around the table and helping create special memories. Hans was, a diff was, was different. He, was, he, was cut, he cut a unique path throughout life, and Maine was an important component of that journey. Um, Paul talked about his time there uh, with Hans, but the one side note that you need to understand is we would go up there for probably like one or two weeks out of the year. Hans liked it so much, he was able to convince my parents to spend the entire summer up there. So my mom stayed with, uh, with the three kids, and my dad would commute, but that was all because of Hans, and he loved it up there so much, and uh, ultimately for, forged a huge bond uh, for our entire family up there. Um, after that, he decided to go to Gould Academy, which is a boarding school in Maine. Uh, never a great student, he found a home. Uh, winters were spent going to class in the mornings, and afternoon was spent at the local, uh, skiing at the local mountain. Uh, it was a great life, but it soon changed. Um, Hans broke his neck over the summer while swimming. Uh, treatment at that time required him to be immobilized and in traction at the hospital for six weeks. Hans remained on his back for the entire time, prohibited from moving. He just rolled with the circumstances, rarely complained, and it was also the same attitude he took when dealing with his cancer struggle. Uh, the health event represented a pivotal change in his life when he returned to school. Unable to ski, he found the theater department, worked on stage design to occupy his free time, and it was extremely rewarding to him since he was mechanically inclined, loved reading and storytelling, and theater pulled from all those qualities. Uh, he continued in stagecraft throughout college, and it became his first career. It eventually led him to Lisa, which was his greatest victory. Hans loved Lisa from the start and cherished her life together. Henry's birth was, was his proudest moment. He loved being a father and a husband and since he gave his life true meaning. Hans was a key bridge to my learning throughout life. He was an effective teacher who enjoyed sharing knowledge or expertise. He lo always loved music. He acquired crates of albums from our older brothers, used his savings to purchase a nice stereo system with large speakers that rocked the house. He enjoyed pulling me into his room, check out a new album or a song he was into. He was an effective counselor uh, when problems were encountered. He provided solid feedback in getting through an issue or how to best approach mom or dad when mistakes were significant. He inspired curiosity without taking ownership, always quick to make recommendations. Eric, you should try this. You should check this out. You might enjoy this. Whatever it was, fill in the blanks. He enjoyed calibrating upon your return, laughed at all your mistakes, and recommended opportunities for improvement in the future. Um, my lasting memory of Hans are his grin, his smile, and his laugh. You encounter many people in life. Many can make you mad. Many can make you sad, but very few have the ability to make you laugh. Hans had that gift to put a smile on your face. 
He was talented in finding humor within the moment. Our final goodbye was, in, was at the marina. One female employee was helping him navigate up the dock and um, he was struggling with it. But he, he turned to me and he said, just my luck. I finally became popular now that I'm sick. <laughs> he made me laugh at the moment when I needed it most. That is what I'll always miss and I'll remember about him. Rest in peace, my brother. I'd start walking your way, you'd start walking mine. We'd meet in the middle neath that old Georgia pine. We'd gain a lot of ground cause we both gave a little and there ain't no road too long when you meet in the middle. This is the refrain from the song, Meet in the Middle by the 1990s country band Diamond Rio and the song that Hans and I danced to at our wedding. And these words are the words that we live by for all of our 29 years of marriage. Please walk with me. We met at Theater Virginia in Richmond. I was a new intern in stage management and he worked in the scene shop. The season was just beginning so everyone in the theater for the first time together had gathered. I kept hearing loud, boisterous laughter behind me, so I turned around and saw three guys dressed in the most torn up, sawdust covered clothes with do rags on their heads and unshaven. The first thing I thought was, ew. <laughs> Hans is one of those guys. A little background. In the late 80s, I was considered preppy. I wore Izod's, Ralph Lauren polos, matched my socks to my shirt, and I wore topsider shoes. I was classic, clean lines, and polished look. I was uptight, naive, and very far from home. Hans, on the other hand, was, as you heard, a grateful deadhead that wore faded t-shirts, didn't match anything, he dressed unconventionally and cared about collective experiences more than material success. He had long hair, was scruffy looking, and way too loud. <laughs> we definitely didn't have much in common. When we first started dating, some people were skeptical and didn't know why Hans was dating me. It did seem as if we were polar opposites. He was so laid back, so easygoing, so amenable. I was not. I needed a plan and to plot my future. So on our third date, I asked him, so where is this going? <laughs> are we just dating or are we gonna try for something? And he said, well, we could try for something. So even though agreed for us to try for a lasting relationship, that summer was the true test to see if he would actually continue a relationship with me. I was invited to Maine. I will say that my first summer there was not stellar. I liked the outdoors. I'd been a Girl Scout during all of my youth. However, inside the house, it was cold. I couldn't get warm. It was the middle of August, and it took me a long time to get my sea legs and to be able to ride in the boats. I wore earmuffs while sailing <laughs> with a swimsuit on, and I cried at dinner several times. Eventually, his mom, Joan, said, take her off the island and go shopping in Freeport. She has island fever. She told me years later that she was very worried that first year. She didn't think I was going to make it as an Islander. However, I proved her wrong the next year because I figured out how to handle Island life and relax just a bit. 
After three years in Richmond, our next journey took us to Montgomery, Alabama to work at the Alabama Shakespeare Festival. Several people from Theater Virginia were moving there and they wanted Hans to go as well. Luckily, he wanted me to go with him. So they reluctantly offered me a job too. Montgomery was the place our relationship really grew into a true loving relationship. He became my best friend. We did everything together. We lived together, drove to and from work together, ate together morning, noon, and night. We even got a dog together, our lab, Jenny. We learned so much about each other, traveling that path, giving and taking when needed, building a solid foundation for our future. After two years in Montgomery, I was accepted into graduate school at UNC Chapel Hill. By this time, we'd been together four years and even got a second dog together, Randy. And I had become a seasoned Islander. That summer before we moved to Chapel Hill, I was driving the boat, yes, I was driving the boat, with Hans to the mainland to get lobsters. As we were pulling away from the mooring, he looked at me and said, hey, Lise, will you marry me? And I looked at him, I said, are you serious? <laughs> and he told me, wait, he told me that he was going to ask me when the time was right, but this definitely was not the right time. We were leaving one city, we were moving to another, I had no church, no friends, and was going to start graduate school. I couldn't think about a wedding. Thus, my question as to his seriousness. I put the boat in park and we floated a bit and he said, yes, I'm serious, will you marry me? And the planner that I am said, well, you're not on your knee. So he easily, the easygoing person that he is, got down on his knee and asked again and of course I said yes. However, we didn't get married until a year and a half later. Major planning was involved, you know. We decided to get married up in Maine, and those of you that were there can attest to this story. In order for me to relax, I had to let go, become easygoing, like Hans, a major feat in itself. So I wrote out note cards to everyone that had anything to do with during the wedding and reception, and when I gave him the card, I said, this is the only way I can relax because I know that you will do the tasks on the card as written. <laughs> so my theater friends were given the task to set up the tables and chairs because it was an outdoor reception. Of course, I drew a floor plan for exactly how it should be set up knowing that, would be, that it would get done. They told me later that they had an argument about the setup. Some of them wanted to deviate from the plan <laughs> because it was such a nice day and wanted to put more tables in the grass instead of under the tent. The others argued that it, I would never stand for that and that they must stick to the plan. I will tell you, I didn't even notice. Because I had my relax and enjoy the day, Hans self on that day. So after graduate school, our life took us to Evansville, Indiana and Cleveland, Ohio, where we decided to settle down and buy a house. We both worked at the Cleveland Playhouse, but he lasted longer there than I did. When I decided to retool my degrees and go back to school to find a new career, I opted for something that made better money and provided health care. When Hans got out of theater, his second career was another way to live off a hobby. <laughs> Thank goodness it was cooking and not sailing. He really found his comfort zone when cooking. He loved cooking for his clients, especially those that needed him to provide good, nutritious meals because they couldn't do it themselves. He enjoyed cooking for the church, the luncheons, the staff dinners, Marion Hill's parties, as well as the other parties that he catered. He loved having Shanthea in the kitchen with him while she was at the church. And later, Shelley would come in on Mondays and help him with his client cooking. Shelley cooked for the church way before Hans, but 
Um, but they became a team. And I thank her for being there for him, especially at the end, when he wanted to provide another meal for his clients, even though it was probably too much for him to handle. Han's cooking career started in 2005, the same year we decided to have a child. For so long, we didn't want children, but we started feeling as if something was missing. So in 2006, we were blessed with Henry. Hans was a wonderful father. He shared all of his hobbies with Henry. He taught him how to cook, how to build with wood, how to drive the motorboat, and how to steer, steer the sailboat. Hans also gave Henry Maine. I want to share with you a paper that Henry wrote in fifth grade. He was one of the winners of the Fathers Matter essay contest for the Cuyahoga County Fatherhood Initiative. We went to a lovely luncheon where Hans was a guest of honor and Henry read his paper to the crowd. This is what he wrote. My dad is really special because he's nice and he cooks for the elderly. He owns his own business called At Home Bistro Personal Chef and Catering. Sometimes he even cooks for our church. Even though he cooks for the elderly and our church, he still always finds time to cook dinner for my mom and me. Since he owns his own business, he comes after school on Tuesdays to teach ultimate Frisbee. During the summer, he takes me up to Maine, where he went as a little kid. We like to go fishing and sailing. Plus, while we're up in Maine, he always tells me Maine stories, which are about what happened to him when he was up in Maine as a little kid. While he's telling me his memories, I'm making my own memories with him. My dad is brave because he constantly battles colon cancer. Even though he has surgery about every six months, he's still able to recover and go back to his normal life. His normal life is waking me up in the morning, caring for me, making sure I get a good breakfast, and even sometimes telling me to do my homework. <laughs> it's very important to me and my mom that my dad keeps fighting the cancer. He's such a loving, caring father and will always be loved by my mom and me, no matter what. As Henry mentioned in his paper, and what I haven't focused on in this recount of our lives is Hans's cancer. As Paul said in 2014, Hans was diagnosed with colon cancer. They told us the surgery was curative and the chemo was preventative. Going through the, uh, going through the surgery and then 11 weeks of chemotherapy was difficult for Hans. But we had hope that it would be okay. Eight months after that, his last chemotherapy session, they told us, it had metastasized to his liver, and we realized that this was not going to go away. We were devastated. He went through so much, surgeries, ablations, three different chemotherapies, lots of side effects that caused pain and sickness. He even gave of himself by participating in trials to help with future colon cancer research. Hans was so brave and strong and determined to never give up. But when it got tough, we would take breaks from chemo just to let his body and mind heal. Maine was his happy place. So that is where we went each summer so that he could recoup. It would give him enough energy to keep going with the treatment so that he could stay with us a little longer his courage was awe-inspiring. Hans and I always said that communication and compromise were the key to a good relationship. Everything else followed if you had these two things. If you can talk about anything and give when the other person needs, you build something that is everlasting. I started walking his way, and he started walking mine. And we met in the middle so many times. We'd gain a lot of ground, 
because we both gave a little. There wasn't a road too long when we met in the middle. You are his friends, his family. Some of you saw him go through the difficult phases of his cancer journey. Some of you didn't even know he had it. He didn't flaunt his sickness. He lived with it to the best of his ability. He has always been a gentle soul, always ready to lend a hand, and always filled the world with exuberant laughter. He has given us so much and touched so many lives. Remember the Hans, that you know wherever you met him on his path. Carry him in your heart and share his kindness and love of laughter whenever you can. Thank you for listening to my story.
A reading from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If I speak in tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, then I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful, or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it too will come to an end. For we know only in part that we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to all childish ways. For now we see in a mirror, dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I, own, now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, and the greatest of these, is love. Amen. Hans Hunsinger taught me how to cook. Not intentionally, he never offered me a class, although I know he surely could have. Instead, on Monday mornings, when Hans was in the church, and I could tell because I could smell onions frying in butter, because he was preparing meals for his clients, I would find an excuse to go down to the church kitchen, and I'd offer to help, which is like having a toddler offer to help you decorate. <laughs> Hans was always so kind and encouraging. He never sent me away or dismissed me. He did put me to work. And as he put me to work over the weeks and months and years, he taught me. He taught me not how to cook specific things, but he taught me the fundamental techniques of cooking. How to temp pork chops, how to dice onions evenly and efficiently, how to resurrect parsley when it had gone limp. The importance of seasoning before and during and after the process of cooking, the difference between frying and sauteing and braising, how to deglaze a pan, when to add wine, when to add cream, when to add butter, always. <laughs> and one of the things he taught me is a miraculous way to cut celery on the bias and thinly so that horrible fibrous vegetable we avoid became succulent and sweet and tender. My children still ask, are we going to have celery the Hans way? Sometimes if I liked something that Hans had cooked, he would just give me the recipe that he was working off of. And really, it was never a recipe in the way we would traditionally understand it. It was a series of ingredients, maybe a couple of hints about times. 
But mostly what Hans taught me about cooking is that if you learned, if you eventually mastered the fundamental techniques, you could actually make a delicious meal out of whatever was on hand, whatever. Those Monday mornings cooking with Hans are precious to me, always have been, because as we cooked and as I learned, we talked. We talked about everything. We talked about politics and religion and the state of the world. We talked about our families of origin, our families now, our children. We talked about our careers. We talked about the church. We talked about his cancer, the treatments, the prognosis. And the thing that astonished me about Hans Hunzinger is that there was never a word of self-pity or outrage at how unfair it was. It was just the slow, steady beat of someone who knew how to make something out of nothing. I wanted to offer spiritual support to Hans. I wanted to provide comfort to him and some sort of consolation, some sort of version of the Christian faith that would maybe answer his questions or improve things for him, but he didn't need it. He never asked that of me. Somehow Hans Hunsinger had already figured it out. If the Apostle Paul had a favorite church, it would have been the one in Corinth. It wasn't the first church he founded. In fact, it was during his second missionary experience that he founded the church in Corinth. And he was there a year and a half, building up this congregation of believers in this new radical faith, which practiced a table hospitality that did not recognize distinctions or differences in people, but set a common meal before all. You all come. Paul was very proud of that church. But after he left, as happens, the church began to struggle. Disputes arose about who was not the most important, but rather the church version of that, which is who had the best spiritual gifts. Who was more important in proclaiming the word? Who should be taken more seriously by the whole congregation? Who should sit at the head of the table? They had taken this radical understanding of equality before God and turned it into what humans are so good at turning things into, which is a contest to be number one. And Paul was so hurt to learn of the way they were struggling and how they were misunderstanding and misforming the Christian church that he wrote to them this letter. Now, it might have been more than one letter, but this is what we have, 1 Corinthians. And he talks about in chapter 12 this plea for unity that you are not separate one from another. You are instead a unified body, each person with their own gifts, part of the whole. And he comes to the end of that gorgeous exposition of the unity of the body, and he finishes with strive for the greater spiritual gifts, and yet I will show you still a more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. This is 1 Corinthians 13. This passage that we read in weddings, and Paul would be so shocked and maybe offended that we do such a thing because he meant for it to be an explanation not of marital love, but of the fundamental principle of the faith. That it is first, foremost, and always about love. 
What Paul is saying in this passage, what he speaks to us, was that no matter what you accomplish in life, no matter how big your career or how long your resume or how many accolades you receive, at the end of the day, your worth is measured by whether or not you loved. Did you love? For if we do not love, we have achieved nothing. Paul knew that love is from God, that love is God. And the three things that we do in this life that last forever, that have eternal meaning, are to have faith, to have hope, and to love. But, as he says, the greatest of these is love. I don't know where he figured it out. I don't know where in his life, and we have had the full description of his life, I don't know where Hans Hunsinker figured that out. But it showed in everything he did. Hans was a man of great love. He loved his family. He loved growing up in New Jersey. He loved Jim and Bill and Eric. He loved his parents. He loved everyone he was related to and all his friends up in Maine. He loved Paul and Mario. He loved his Shaker friends, the people who have formed such an amazing community around he and Lisa and Henry. He loved sailing. He loved sunsets. He loved the people on the island. He loved fishing. He loved everything to do with life. He loved the arts. He loved music and theater. He loved cooking and catering and feeding people. But most of all, he loved Lisa. He one time expressed to me in a conversation that he wondered why she put up with him, but he was very grateful. He also loved Henry. Hans had the delight and wonder that comes with being an older parent, someone who didn't anticipate the incredible things that happen when you give birth to a human who then comes with their own gifts and their own agenda. He was constantly amazed at the way Henry challenged and pushed and grew and even taught him. I think about the way Hans lived these last nine years. I think about the grace and dignity with which he handled his cancer. Not that he fought it, not that he battled it, but that he lived with cancer. And I think I know the answer. Hans got through this because he was a man of great love. In the Christian faith, he had mastered the fundamentals. He knew what really mattered. And because of that, he could make something out of a life that had given him joy as well as sorrow, triumph as well as struggle. We didn't talk about specific faith a lot. We were both congregational by background, which mean we had a skepticism of churchy stuff. And we also had a basic faith that God was good. And so we weren't going to worry too much about the details. But though he never put his faith into words, Though he never told me what his creedal statement was because Congregationalists don't do creeds. He instead demonstrated it to me and to each and every one of you with every word, every act, every boat trip, every fish, every meal. Hans Hunsinger was a man of great love and he showed us what it means to appreciate this gift of life that is so short and so beautiful. 
When he asked me to speak at his service, I knew that this was the one thing that I could do for him. I'm so grateful to Pastor Matt for allowing me this privilege. But for a man who fed me, who taught me, who laughed with me, who smiled with me, this is the one gift I can give in return. Hans Hunzinger was a remarkable man. And I know that God is blessing him. I hope that you remember that you have been blessed by him too. Amen. I want to take a moment and share two notes about our time together today. You may not often hear at a service like this that uh, excerpt of The Planets by Holst. <laughs> Hans one time said that whenever the time for this service came, he wanted the organ to be big <laughs> and loud. People tend to uh, find the part of the sanctuary that they're comfortable with, and this was Hans's section up here where you see the balloon and also his earthly remains as they are with us today before going to their place of rest. Please join me in a spirit of prayer. Almighty God, our strength and our redeemer, giver of life and conqueror of death, we praise you with humble hearts. With faith in your great mercy and wisdom, we entrust Hans B. Hunziger into your eternal care. We give thanks for your steadfast love for him all the days of his earthly life. We thank you for all that he has been to those who loved him and for his service to the Church of Jesus Christ and to his wider human family. We thank you for his deep kindness, his giving heart, his dedication to taking care of others. We give thanks for his enjoyment of the gifts of life, for his smile and his laugh, for his skill and his interest in sharing it with others. We give thanks for his good friendships for his meaningful family relationships. We give thanks for the love shared by Hans and Lisa and for the life they built together and shared, meeting in the middle, creating a beautiful marriage and for the love that he shared with their son, Henry. We give thanks for the amazing story that he made of his life. Like a good chef will take whatever is found in the pantry and create something wonderful, so Hans did in both the kitchen and in life. We thank you for the love that he received and the love that he gave. And today we thank you that now for your son, all pain and sorrow are ended and death itself is past and he has entered the home where all your people gather in peace. O oh God, keep us in communion with your faithful of every time and place. We pray in the name of Jesus and as he taught his disciples to pray, so we are bold to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.
I invite you now to rise again in body or in spirit to join in our closing hymn in the black hymnal 438, When Peace Like a River. Final reading, I chose long ago 
before I knew that this would be the day of this service, this poem, because it reminded me of Hans. And now seeing the pictures that have been featured in the bulletin, I can't think of anything better. This is the poem, The Unknown Shore, by Elizabeth Clark Hardy. Sometime at eve when the tide is low, I shall slip my moorings and sail away. With no response to a friendly hail in the silent hush of the twilight pale, when the night stoops down to embrace the day and the voices call in the water's flow. Sometime at eve, when the tide is low, I shall slip my moorings and sail away through the purple shadows that darkly trail or the ebbing tide of the unknown sea and a ripple of waters to tell the tale of a lonely voyager sailing away to mystic isles where at anchor lay the craft of those who have sailed before or the unknown sea to the unseen shore. A few who have watched me sail away will miss my craft from the busy bay. Some friendly boats that were anchored near some loving souls that my heart held dear in silent sorrow will drop a tear. But I shall have peacefully furled my sail in moorings sheltered from the storm and gale and greeted friends who have sailed before or the unknown sea to the unseen shore. Into your hands, almighty God, we commend your son, Hans Hunziker. Acknowledge, we pray, a sheep of your own fold, a son of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the company of the saints in light. Amen. And now as you go forth from this sacred time, may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your minds and your hearts secure in the knowledge and love of the risen Christ and the abiding comfort of the Holy Spirit. And may God bless your life as God blessed Hans with a care reaching out to others, with a deep engagement in the wonderful gifts of this life, and with such great love to know and to share. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.